Our first speaker is Dr. Mark Peterson. He's the head of the Korea section Department of Asian and Near Eastern Languages at Brigham Young University in Utah. Prior to his appointment at BYU, he was the director of the Fulbright program in Korea. He has a B bachelor's in Asian studies and anthropology from Brigham Young University and a PhD in East Asian languages and civilization from Harvard University. Please welcome Dr. Peterson. We're live. How are you? You're here to learn about Korea, huh? How many of you have been to Korea? Oh, good. Some of you. How, how many went to Korea with the Korea Society Teachers Program? Oh, you're the only one. Um, how, did, how have the rest of you been to Korea? You're from Korea? Who else has been to Korea? What have you done in Korea? Uh, <laughs> A short side trip. Who else has been to Korea? Under what capacity? Uh, well, okay. Um, I was thinking, I've got to tell you some things about Korea, and a good teacher always likes to pretest, see where people are, and uh, I'm thinking that on a 1 to 10 scale about Korea, I think I'm a 10. I think I know about Korea. There are people that know more, you can be a 10 plus, maybe, but I, I'm a 10. Uh, how many of you have been in Korea enough that you think you're a uh, five? Really? How many of you think, how many of you have been in Korea enough that you think you're a four? You're a four? Okay. How many of you think you might be a three? Maybe? Or a two? A two, maybe? Are you from Korea? No. Chinese? Um, how many are a one? Or a zero. <laughs> That's the most of you. Okay, so we'll we'll start from scratch. Um, we'll teach to the zeros, and the threes and fours can ride for a while, and then you can contribute if you like. I, I prepared this little handout for you. Uh, do you have this? Is that in your folder somewhere? It's just a, a timeline, and I did it um, uh, archaeologically, meaning. The recent is on the top, and then you have to dig down uh, to layer after layer to get to the older. Does that make sense to you? Do you like archaeological time, ch time charts? Um, and I purposely put uh, uh, the Chosen Dynasty, since that's our emphasis, in uh, a larger font. And I put in the rest of Korean history just so you'd have the background on it. We're talking about the Chosen Dynasty, but I think we should put it in context. And so I put the rest of the Korean timeline in small font. So you see post uh, Chosun Dynasty is this small font stuff right at the top of your page. And then pre Chosun Dynasty, pre-1392, is the small font at the bottom of the archaeological strata of this timeline. Does that make sense to you? So you see, um, let's, let's go from the bottom. Uh, I've got the ancient states down here, the mythological, mythological, oh boy, did I misspell that? Uh, uh, you've got the mythological states of uh, Pak Hyakkose and Tangun. I think I have this up here. Yeah, it's up here. Um, these are two of the early myths. Hyakkose and Tangun are two of the important myths for founding of Korea. Then you've got the three Han tribes that are prehistoric. And then you have uh, uh, the three kingdoms, Shila, Pekje, and Koguryo. So if we talk about Korean history, in general terms, and the Chosun Dynasty in its context, before the Chosun Dynasty was uh, the three kingdoms, Pekje, Shila, and Koguryo. And of those three kingdoms, uh, Shila was the strongest eventually and conquered the other two, and that's where you have the un un unified Shila period in 668 onward. And then you have uh, the Koryo Dynasty from 918 to 1392, so in other words, all of the pre chosun Dynasty stuff is fairly simple. Uh, Korea has a very interesting history in that you only have three major dynasties from the unified Shila. Before that, you have smaller kingdoms, but from a unified uh, period only, uh, you have the Shila Dynasty, the Koryo Dynasty, and then the Chosun Dynasty. And before the unified period, you have the three kingdoms. So three is the operative number, you see. And uh, uh, I, I like to uh, uh, teach this part by 
making reference to Sesame Street. It's like this lesson on Korean history is brought to you by the number three. Okay, if you can do the number three, you can do Korean history. Okay, you've got the three kingdoms, and then after that, in succession, three dynasties. Now, how does that compare with other countries that you know? When you look at the dynastic history, you know, as you look at the memorizing the dynasties of all these uh, other kingdoms, it's usually quite a long list, isn't it? And uh, the lifespan of a dynasty, well, some can be very, very short. Some don't last beyond the founder. For example, uh, the Qin dynasty at the founding of, the, of China only lasted as long as Qin Shi Huangdi. Uh, and then you have the Han dynasty, and it rolls forward from there. Uh, let me ask you a question about lifespans of dynasties. If you think of a dynasty as a living organism, you know, how long does a dynasty live? And the answer is, if you look at most dynasties in East Asia, in the Middle East, in Europe, anywhere you can find a dynasty, they tend to have a lifespan of somewhere between two and three hundred years. It's, it's almost like talking about a human being living between, you know, 60 and 80 years, sometimes at a hundred as an outlier, you know. Uh, it's almost as if a, a, a dynasty has a, a lifespan. It's born, it goes through a, 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 a teenage period perhaps, a mature period, an aging period, and then it dies. And most dynasties in most places of the world, look it up, are around 250 years, plus or minus a generation or two. Uh, Korean dynasties are how long? Yeah. 400, 500 years. The Chosun dynasty that we're focusing on was 518 years. The uh, Koryo dynasty was 474 years. The Shila dynasty from unification was 276 years, but from the Three Kingdoms Shila through unification was 1,000 years. So what does this say about Korean history in general? It indicates a certain degree of stability, does it not? We have these long-lived dynasties. And this narrative that I'm presenting to you is different from what most Koreans present about their own history. And uh, the reason for that is quite simple and quite obvious, and that is that history, are you all history teachers? We have a mix of teachers here, don't we? Some language and some other things, yeah. Uh, history, you history majors would know, is not a thing that writes itself. History is not some abstract set of facts that are out there that we're going to discover. History is a narrative that we construct to tell something. And what we're usually trying to tell is how we got to be where we are. It's an explanation of who we, as a people, whoever we happens to be, who we are. And uh, the we of Korea of the 20th century was a sad time. Look at the top of the list here. You've got all this war business, liberation from the Japanese, takeover by the Japanese, World War II, division of the country, uh, the Korean War, and the country is still divided. We still have problems between North and South Korea. Um, lots of problems. We've got a new leader in North Korea, a young boy that doesn't know what he's doing. You know, we've got problems. Uh, the narrative of the 20th century, and spilling now into the 21st century, is a narrative of war, is a narrative of chaos, is a narrative of division. It is a narrative of an unhappy people. So how did we get here? The history that most Koreans will tell you, if you talk to your average Korean on the street, is a story of chaos and war and, and turmoil and invasions. And you, you, you get this story from the 20th century because Koreans feel quite victimized, and rightly so, by the 20th century. Korea was indeed victimized. Who divided Korea in half? It wasn't the Koreans. They didn't want that. It was the United Nations, the United States. They wanted to throw a sop to the Russians. You know what that means? They wanted to make the Russians happy at the end of World War II. Why? The Russians were being pulled into the Pacific War somewhat reluctantly. The Russians had had their hands full with the European front. In fact, as victims of the war, of the greatest number of people that died, 
you know, who wins that prize? The Russians, you know. There are more Russians killed than Germans, than Poles, than anyone else that wants to play the victim card. We're playing cards here. The Russians have the victim card. They trumped. And uh, the Americans were worried about a post-war world. They knew the Russians were these communists, whatever that meant at that time. And they wanted to have a uh, setup where they could get along in a post-war world. And so the Americans pressured the Russians to enter the Pacific War at the end of the European War. The war was over with Germany already, all right? We're still fighting in Japan, right? And as we prepare to invade Japan, it's going to be a big deal, a big deal. We found already in island hopping, we mean in the United States, in island hopping, um, Guadalcanal, Kwajalein, these battles moving up toward uh, uh, Japan, Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima, oh boy. The, the wars were horrific, and just taking small islands was very, very costly in blood and treasure for the United States. So what was going to be, what was going to be like to invade mainland Japan. It was going to be horrific. This is before the atomic bomb. We didn't know when the Manhattan Project was going to be successful. When that thing, when they figured it out, they rolled that out within a few days. And boom, there goes the atomic bomb. But before that, that we're looking at a, what's the word for non-nuclear? Uh, conventional warfare uh, uh, attack on the mainland main island of Japan, and we, the United States, figured if we had Russia coming in from this side, and we come in from this side, it'll be all the more effective to force a surrender in Japan. Well, we got the bomb instead. Boom, the war's over, and so what are we going to do with the Russians? The United States, in its great wisdom, irony, irony, decided to let the Russians have a prize. And what was the Russian prize going to be? Well, in Europe, the Russians got a fourth of Germany, right? And the other three-fourths of Germany were divided up between France, England, and the United States. They consolidated, made West Germany, and that one quarter of Germany became East Germany for all those decades. And Germany was the perpetrator of the war. And they rightly, you could argue, were punished by being divided up. It's okay, right? So in the Pacific War, the perpetrator of the war was Japan. So let's divide up Korea. There, there's something wrong here, you know? I mean, the train jumped the track. I mean, is my... Syllogism correct, you know? I mean, there's something wrong with having divided up Korea the way it was. So how does Korea feel about that? Well, in a word, victimized, you know. So much of the narrative of the 20th century is this narrative of victimization, being taken over by the Japanese at the beginning of the 20th century, being divided up by powers beyond their own, and which division turned into this war in which well, North and South Korea did have their own antagonisms, but in and of themselves, it wouldn't have led to a civil war. It was really a manifestation of the Cold War powers, this tension between the communist bloc in Russia and the free bloc in the United States. And, and it was that expression that turned into the Korean War. So Korea, again, is victimized. So the, the narrative of the 20th century is a narrative of victimization. And it's an unhappy narrative. And so when you talk to most Koreans, what is your history like? Well, history is a reflection of the present. And if the present is unhappy, history is unhappy. It tells us how we got here. Okay? What I want to do today is take you out and away from that, from the 20th century, and look at uh, Korean history, and it's particularly the Chosun dynasty, in a non-victimized point of view, in a non-20th century point of view, in a more objective and sort of satellite <laughs> on high look at, at what Korean history was like, you see. 
And so um, if we can step away from the 20th century, and I think Korean historians are starting to do this now, because Korea today, South Korea at least, is not an unhappy place. It's not an unhappy place by any means. South Korea today is a very happy place. I mean, it's successful. Uh, society works. There's wealth. There's a successful economy. They, they've done things. They've hosted the Olympics, for heaven's sakes. They've hosted the World Cup soccer things. You know, they, they do things on an international scale. They crave recognition. Um, I like to say that Korea suffers from a Rodney Dangerfield complex. Most of you here are old enough to understand that. <laughs> I tell my students that now, they go, hmm? Who's Rodney Dangerfield, you know? But you remember Rodney Dangerfield? I tell you, I get no respect. I got to tell you, I get no respect. <laughs> Pretty bad Rodney Dangerfield imitation. But you get the drift. And Korea feels that way. They feel that they get no respect. They, they're the country that's been victimized, you see. And so anytime they can get any respect, they just crave it. They just crave getting that respect. Uh, for example, in recent years, UNESCO, United Nations, what does UNESCO stand for? United Nations Educational, Social, or the Scientific, Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. Uh, in recent years, UNESCO has designated certain places in Korea as World Heritage Sites. How did the, how did the Koreans respond to that? <gasps> wow, yeah, we well, get some recognition. Yeah, this place, that place is a World Heritage Site. Uh, I think it's really interesting to look at the UNESCO designations in Korea and contra contrast that to the UNESCO designations in America. Do you know how people in the Southwest feel about UNESCO? Get the United Nations out of here. They're not telling us what to do. You know, Canyon Lands, Arches, Zions uh, Park, Grand Canyon. Don't you make those a UNESCO designation. Keep the United Nations out of here. That's the attitude in the Southwest about UNESCO. <laughs> but in Korea, it's just 180 degrees. Yeah, we get some recognition. Yeah. It's a world-class thing we got there, you know. The Sokoram Buddhist stone Buddha up on the hill. The uh, 80,000 wood blocks for printing the Buddha scripture. That's UNESCO. That's recognized. It's a world-class thing. So um, that's all as a matter of perspective on the way Korea sort of sees itself. And I think that in the 21st century, Korea is going to become a much more confident country, and I think the history is going to be rewritten. And in fact, a lot of younger scholars are starting to look at things a little differently. For example, the topic at hand today is the Chosun Dynasty. And the Chosun Dynasty, in the minds of many traditional historians, has been a kind of a negative thing in some ways. It's sort of been kind of a mixed bag. There were a lot of good things about the Chosun Dynasty, but there were some bad things about the Chosun Dynasty. The Chosun Dynasty, for example, it lasted 518 years. It was too long. <laughs> There's an attitude on the part of some of the Koreans that, that was too long. That was kind of a shameful thing. That a dynasty, you know, compared to a modern democratic government is an old-fashioned, you know, feudalistic, if you want to use that term, old-fashioned uh, thing and it lasted for so long, it's, it's in some people's view, is a little bit of a, uh, an embarrassment. But where does that point of view come from? Well, it turns out that when the Chosun Dynasty ended in 1910, it ended at the hands of not the Koreans, but the Japanese. And the Japanese offered a alternative point of view. They offered to the Koreans not the Japanese dictatorship that it turned into, but what the Japanese offered the Koreans was democracy and a modern state. And they achieved this through the cooperation of most Koreans. Most Koreans. Most Koreans were in favor of this new state. In fact, Koreans were elected to office, not only in Korea, 
but there were Koreans living in Japan that ran for political office and were elected at local levels and at the national level in Japan, as well as in, as well as in Korea. So when the Japanese come in and say in 1910, we've got to get rid of this old dynasty and set up something new, they said we're going to set up a democracy. And if you're a Korean and you're looking at the world and the world is developing democracies left and right, and you, in 1910, have a dynasty still, a king, a monarchy, and you're offered a democracy, what are you going to choose? What are you going to do? You're going to take the democracy. And most Koreans went along with that. And many Koreans are not happy when I say this, but most Koreans were collaborators. Most Koreans were collaborators. They were going along with this. I didn't realize this until one day in 19... 84, approximately, um, sometime in the early 80s. Uh, my context was Japan was a bad deal as far as Korea is concerned. This context came from Koreans who generally have nothing good to say about Japan. At one level, at least the Japanese takeover of Korea, there's nothing good to be said about that. And so... Uh, you know, and you know, the Japanese came over, came in, and they took over. And Koreans had to quit speaking Korean, had to start speaking Japanese. Koreans had to take on Japanese names. If you run into an older Korean, you can ask them, "What was your Japanese name?" They may not be happy about telling you, <laughs> but most of the time, it's kind of a funny thing. Yeah, I used to go by. Masako Itagawa, <laughs> they have a Japanese name. And uh, it's kind of a strange thing. And Koreans were forced to take on Japanese names. Korean language was taught in Korea as a foreign language in the university. And so you come into this idea of Korea being taken over by the Japanese in the Japanese period, and there's nothing good to be said about the Japanese. Okay? this dictatorship, this World War II, this business. But remember, the Japanese took over in 1910, not 1945. It ended in 1945. And the revelation I had in 1984, sometime in the early 80s, was I visited a countryside village, a prominent village with a lot of nice things, and I was talking to the people there, and I was talking to an older woman who was in her 80s, in the 80s. So she was born around 1900. She remembers the Japanese takeover in 1910. And she said something I had never heard from a Korean before or since. And that was, oh, at the beginning, the Japanese weren't so bad. What? <laughs> I've never heard such a thing. She said, yeah, in the beginning, the Japanese weren't so bad. Then you look into it and you read some of the stuff about it. And you find that there were a lot of collaborators, a lot of people who saw that this, this modernization that the Japanese were offering was in contrast to the Chosun dynasty, you see, in contrast to the monarchy, the feudalistic past of Korea. So when the Japanese and the Koreans at the hand of the Japanese threw over the monarchy, there's nothing good to be said about it right? It's the old. We're going to get rid of the old. We're going to set up the new. The monarchy is the old. We're going to set up a democracy. You see, so what is there good to be said about the Chosun dynasty? Precious little. And so much of the attitude of ordinary Koreans about the Chosun dynasty is somewhat negative because it was the old thing that we got rid of. Now I'll conclude here today by making the statement that uh, no dynasty ends nobly. They all end ignobly. That's the definition of a dynasty. A dynasty falls. You know, A dynasty is set up, it rises, and eventually it falls. There's no election and change of government. You, know, you don't shake hands with George Bush and then start a new 
Obama administration. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. Dynasties fall ignobly. And the new dynasty has nothing good to say about the old dynasty. The Japanese period has nothing good to say about the Chosun dynasty. Okay, So uh, you run into some of these negative attitudes about the Chosun dynasty because it was the feudal past. But we're going to look at it differently. We're going to look at the feudal past as the feudal past, as the way it was. That's the way the world was. And to look at the Chosun dynasty in terms of Wilsonian democracy or Jeffersonian democracy or something like that is an unfair comparison. You know, you, you, you just don't do that. It's like comparing a Corvette to a, a, a horse-drawn carriage. You see, uh, you don't do that. They're forms of transportation, but they represent radically different time frames. Okay, so those are the rules of the game. Ready to roll? Let's get on our ox cart. <laughs> and roll then. So here's a bit of setup I've got. Here's then are the major events of the Chosun Dynasty that I thought we'd go over today. Uh, as I looked at it, I thought, well, let's see, there are kind of three clusters of events. And I know ah, there's like four clusters of events. And I, and I looked at it, oh, no, there's sort of five major areas I want to focus on. And so the more I looked at it, I realized that it's sort of by centuries. And so that makes a nice framework to deal with this. There, there are major events that we want to look at, but we can look at them as something of the 1400s, something of the 1500s, something of the 1600s, something of the 1700s, something of the 1800s, and then we've done it. So the five centuries of the Chosun Dynasty are very easily uh, handled as five events, five uh, clusters of events. And so that's what we've got. And so I, I reduced it to this, plus the founding, which is a 1300s event, 1392, so just barely 1300s. Plus, well, here, here's the, uh, the general categorization. Uh, the founding, the 1400s will be looking at King Sejong and the invention of uh, Hangul alphabet as the highlight. Then we'll look at the philosophy of the 1500s. That was the hallmark of the 1500s. We'll look at the Great Transformation, again, Confucian philosophy in the 1500s, Confucian transformation in the 1600s. We'll look at the perfection of a Confucian state in the 1700s, and then we'll look at chaos and disintegration in the 1800s. So this will be the framework. But there's one other thing I've got to throw in there, and that is in the middle of this 15-1600s philosophical Confucian development, we've got a war. We've got an invasion, and we've got to deal with that. So that's the uh, 1592 uh, invasion from uh, Japan. Okay, so that's our framework. So basically, five centuries, five major eras to look at, with a founding piece and a war piece. So that's our our structure. Okay, so that's a that sets out our framework for us there. Okay, let's go to the founding. Let's talk about the founding. Now, along the way here, I've thrown in two romanizations of a lot of the different words. Uh, Generally here at the Korea Society and generally in most American academic situations, they use what's called the McCune-Reichauer system. And most of the romanization you'll see will be McCune-Reichauer. But uh, the Korean government has gone back and forth over the years in putting in uh, a romanization system that they're a little happier with. And um, uh, the parenthesis there for Lee sung and for Chung mong ju is the uh, uh, modern Romanization, the 2000 system they call it, or the RR, the Revised Romanization System. Uh, just a word on Romanization, it, it's a royal pain. It's a royal pain, and there's no happy solution. There is none, and the reason there is none is that Korean phonology and English phonology are diametrically opposed. They're as different as they can be, and because of that, there's no happy union of the of the uh, Romanization uh, 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 Japanese, no problem. Romanization is easy. Chinese, they've had one old system, they have a new system, people are just into the new system. Uh, no problem, basically. It works. But uh, uh, Korean Romanization is just an unhappy situation. It's just the Korean phonology is just so different that you're stuck with all sorts of accommodations in English. And so I'll, I'll generally stick with uh, McCune Reichauer, but I'll throw in a little bit of uh, the revised system because you'll run into that. And if you do some background reading, you want to prepare some uh, uh, lesson outlines for your class, and you do a little background reading, you'll see both romanizations. 
And it's, it's uh, unfortunate, but you just have to roll with the punches. If it looks like it's somewhat similar, it's similar, okay? Uh, Pusan, second largest city of Korea. Pusan, starts with a P. Starts with a B. <laughs> Pusan with a P, Pusan with a B. It's the same place, okay? Don't get hung up on it. They didn't move. Uh, Tegu, T-A-E-G-U. D-A-E-G-U. Tegu, Degu, it's the same thing. It's Tegu, okay? Uh, so don't get too hung up on romanization. Uh, I used to live in Kwangju, and I wrote my mother a letter. Kwangju, uh, back in those days, we didn't have the two romanization systems. You sort of did what you felt. Kwangju, and when I first went there, I spelled it with a K. Uh, that's K, Kwangju. And then after a while, I thought, no, it's kind of a G, Kwangju. So I spelled it with a G. My mother wrote back and said, when would you move? <laughs> I didn't move. I just changed the spelling. It's the same thing. So don't get too hung up on the spelling. If it looks similar to what you just read about before some other place, it's, it's the same thing. Okay. There are charts. There are charts available. If you go to the Korea Society website, uh, they have a romanization link. Or you can just Google romanization of Korea, and you can see the two systems. You can look up and see how they're spelled differently. So if you have a question about it, it's quite easy to resolve. Whether this is the same thing, the same place, the same guy, uh, you can look that up. Okay. The founding of the dynasty goes like this. There was a man by the name of Yi sung -ge. He was a, uh, a general. He'd been fighting against the Japanese pirates. He'd been posted up north fighting against the Jurchens. Um, Korea has had a lot of border skirmishes with uh, the Jurchens and the Ketons, who were Manchurian people up north. And uh, he'd had some fighting experience. He was a general. And he was in the capital, the capital of the Koryo dynasty, before we moved to Seoul, where it is now. The capital of the Koryo dynasty was Kesung. And Kesung is just across the border into North Korea today, it's just barely in North Korea. We took a group of uh, our teachers there one time several years ago, and now North and South Korea are angry with each other, and so there's this border thing doesn't go on. But for a while there, you could go, you could take a day trip into Kesung. We did it one time. Uh, Kesung was the Koryo capital. Now you've got your timeline there, so you see Koryo is the previous dynasty, right? So you've got your context there. So in the previous dynasty, Koryo dynasty, Koryo, by the way, is the dynasty that came in contact with the Western world, which gave us the name for Korea. And the Koryo dynasty fell, the Chosun dynasty comes in, Korea calls itself Chosun, but we still call it Korea. Uh, uh, in South Korea today, they call themselves Hanguk. They don't call themselves Korea, they call themselves Hanguk. North Korea today calls themselves Chosun still. North Korea is Chosun. Uh, but South Korea is Hanguk, and neither one of them is Korea. If they unify, I wouldn't be surprised if they named the new country Korea. You see, that would work, because that's the country the rest of the world calls them. They could call the new country no longer Hangu, no longer Chosun, but have a new name, which is the old name, Koryo, or Korea. So we're talking about the Koryo dynasty, located in Kesung. Uh, Lee sung is a general there, and he has a friend, <laughs> an enemy, <laughs> a rival, by the name of Che Young. And Che Young goes to the king and says, you know, we really should go fight against the Ming Dynasty. Now what's going on with China? The Ming Dynasty has just recently taken over and has driven out the Mongols. The Mongols had what was called the Yuan Dynasty. You know, the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty it was a great dynasty. It was Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, covered the whole world, virtually. And uh, Marco Polo went to China. The reason he made such a big hit, there were other Italians that went to China, but the reason Marco Polo was such a big hit was that he actually stayed for a while. He was actually a government official. He was a, a, a what do you call it, a tariff inspector, a customs inspector in one of the port cities for the Chinese for the Mongols, who were ruling China at the time. So the Mongols had taken over China during the Yuan Dynasty, 13th, 14th century. But mid-14th century, the Ming Dynasty, the native Chinese come back, drive out the Mongols. Here we are in Kesong, 
And Che Young goes to the king and says, we should go fight against the Ming Dynasty. Wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense at all. The Ming Dynasty just came in and drove out the Mongols. Well, the Koreans during the Koryo Dynasty, late Koryo, when the, after the Mongols came in, were an in-law state to the Mongols. The Mongols had come in, they had virtually conquered Korea. They didn't take over and administer Korea directly. They left the Korean king on the throne, but they had that Korean king marry a Mongol princess. And his son, the next king, married a Mongol princess. And his son, the next king, married a Mongol princess. The kings had eight generations of Mongol blood. So deeply tied to the Mongols. And so the, uh, the king, with some sympathy to the Mongols, and Che Young, this other general, they think they should go back and fight the Ming dynasty that was claiming some territory up north that the Koreans claimed. And so these two decided they should fight the Ming dynasty. Now, does that sound like a good idea to you? Brand new, strong dynasty, just drove out the Mongols, we're going to go fight the Ming dynasty. Doesn't sound like a very good idea, but Che Young, Yi sung enemy, says, yeah, let's, send, let's fight the, the Ming dynasty, and let's send all Yi sung up to do it. And so the king says, okay, and he, he took the advice of his loyal advisor, Ch General Che Young, and they send Yi sung to fight the Mongols. Well, Yi sung is a general. You salute, you say, yes sir, and get your soldiers and you march up to fight the, Mong the, the Ming Dynasty. Well, as he's marching along, you know, he's saying, this ain't a good idea. You know, this ain't a good idea. Well, a lot of generals were given orders to go do something that ain't a good idea. So you march, you march. And it's summertime, and in Korea you get the monsoon. The rains come, and they march, and they march up to North Korea, up through North Korea, up toward fighting the Ming Dynasty in China. They get up to the Yalu River, the border with China. They get to an island crossing over the Yalu River, and finally Yi sung says, enough's enough. This is insane. I've got good boys here, you know, good soldiers, good troops. Why should I sacrifice their lives for nothing? He's a good general. I've got a better idea. <laughs> Let's go back to Kesong and take over. And so he marches back to Kesong. And a lot faster than they march north, they march back to Kesong. They move in with his troops, they take over. And th he displaces the king, puts another puppet king on the throne for a while, takes care of his old buddy Che Young, has him executed for sending him off on this suicide mission. And he says, we're going to set up a new dynasty. He's very clever about it because he just doesn't go in and do it in one day. He actually did it in one day. He marched back and took over. But he decides to lay low for a while, stay behind the scenes. If you stay behind the scenes, you don't catch any slings and arrows. That phrase, slings and arrows. So who do you set up to take the slings and arrows? You put a puppet out there. And he put up a, different, uh, a distant relative of the king, replaced him after a while, put another king up there to make sure that he was in control. And for four years, from 1388 until 1392, he lays behind the scene laying the groundwork for setting up this new dynasty. And in doing so, he has to decide who is going to be on his side. Who is going to be loyal to him and who is going to be loyal to the old dynasty? We've got to s set this up. We've got to see. And he used his son. His son was already a general by this time, Yi Bang Wan. In fact, one of my Korean uh, history colleagues uh, said, really, Yi Bang Wan did it. The establishment of the dynasty was really Yi Bang Wan. And what happens is when the kingdom is set up in 1392, Yi Sung Ge becomes Tejo. Tejo is the Chinese equivalent of Taizu which is the name of the founder of the dynasty, the royal name, the king name. Every founder of a Chinese dynasty is, is Taizu, the Tejo, the founder of the dynasty. The number two guy, the second king, the first son of the first king, is always ta Tejong, Taizong in Chinese. And Yi Bang Wan becomes Taizong, or Tejong. And in between, there's another king in there, but he's just a puppet. He doesn't play an important role. So Tejong, Yi Bang Wan becomes really the third king, but he does the same thing. He puts a brother on the throne to take slings and arrows. 
in case there's any opposition. And then once thing, things are secure and he knows he's got control, he steps up and takes over. So these two men were the founders, the true founders of the, of the Chosen Dynasty. Who's this third guy? Well, for four years, from 1388 to 1392, Is is trying to decide who's going to support him and who's not. And Isungye is a very smart guy because although he's a military man, he studied his history and he has seen that military men, like the founder of the Qin Dynasty in China is overthrown and the Han Dynasty comes in, the founder of the Sui Dynasty of China is a military guy, he's overthrown and the Tang Dynasty comes in. He sees that military guys have trouble if they run a dynasty on the basis of military uh, uh, principle, military power alone. And already at this point, Confucianism has come in fairly strongly in the Koryo period. Confucianism actually enters Korea in the Shila period. Okay, you're learning your dynasty now, Shila, Koryo, Chosun. Uh, actually, Confucianism makes its appearance in the Shila dynasty. So Confucianism is growing stronger and stronger. You've got a lot of Confucian scholars. Now, what is Confucianism? Above and beyond anything else, as far as what we're talking about right now, is it's a form of governance. It's a form of administration. It's a set of principles that helps you to run a state and run a society. The opposite of Korea, the alternative uh, thing you have in Korea, is Buddhism. Is Buddhism associated with statecraft? No, it's, you know, we don't do nothing with the state in Buddhism. You know, the Buddhism, you meditate, you know, you work on perfecting your soul and such. Buddhism has nothing to do with running a state. It might have something to do with running a society, maybe, maybe not. Confucianism has nothing to do with heaven or hell <coughs> or the next life. Confucianism is about running a state. And so Confucianism seems like a good ideology to use. And, and Isangye catches on to this, and he goes to a bunch of the Confucian scholars that are out there and says, hey, our Koryo dynasty is pretty corrupt. We've got this mixed marriage with the Mongols, and the Mongols have fallen. We've got a lot of problems with Koryo. We ought to start all over again and set up a new dynasty. What do you think? And most of the Confucian scholars agreed with Isangye. Yeah, let's do it. You've taken over militarily. We'll support you philosophically. We'll set up a new dynasty. Let's do it. Everybody's on board, except for this guy, Chong Mongjo. And he can't see it. He can't see it because he is a true Confucian scholar. And in Confucianism, you know, it's statecraft and society, societal principles and all this stuff, but it's also loyalty. It's loyalty. It's loyalty. The first principle of Confucianism is probably filial piety, respect for your parents. But the extension of that is to the parent of the country, loyalty to the country. And so if you're a true Confucian and you're given a chance to be disloyal to your king, what you gonna do? Now, a lot of the Confucian scholars saw other principles as operating here. We can do this. We can operate a, a new dynasty. We can go ahead with this. That's okay. Let's do it. But not Chang Mongju. He couldn't do it because he was loyal. Loyalty. He was loyal to the previous king. He could not support a new king. He said, there are not two sons up in the heaven. There cannot be two kings on the throne. That makes sense, doesn't it? And he said it in the most memorable fashion. He said, though I die and die again, though I die a hundred deaths, after my bones have turned to dust, whether my soul exists or not, my red heart, forever loyal to my king, forever loyal to my Lord, will never fade away. This is a shijo. This is a Shijo. And um, um, using literature in a history class is a very smart thing to do. Literature captures the essence of some things just better than anything else can do. And this poem captures the essence of this dilemma. This dilemma that Chung Mongju was facing. Do I support the new dynasty or do I not? No, I cannot support the new dynasty. 
I cannot support the new dynasty because I am loyal to my king. He was given the opportunity to join in the coup, to be a part of the new dynasty. He and many of his colleagues were already in high position in the Koryo government. That's why Isangye went to them. They knew what they were doing. They were accomplished men. He didn't go to a bunch of upstarts. He didn't go to a bunch of rebels. He didn't go to a bunch of brigands out in the woods you know, to, to, to take over this new dynasty. He went to the people that were already there. And he goes to Chung Mongju and says, we want you to help us in this new dynasty. We're going to form a coup. We're taking over. They didn't speak French. They didn't say coup. They said that we're taking over. And Chang Wong Ju had, had his choice. He was offered the choice to help the new dynasty. And he knew that if he said no, he was a dead man. Right? Right? When you're asked to join in a coup to take over, you're going to be killing some people. You're going to be deposing a king and his loyal supporters. And if you're asked to help with this and you say no, you're throwing yourself into the old camp. You're, you're, you're signing your own death warrant. You're a dead man. And he knew it. And in spite of that, he said, though I die, Though I die again, though I die a hundred deaths. You know, these folks were uh, living in a Buddhist context, Buddhist and Confucian context, the two mix. And in Buddhism, what happens when after you die? You're born again, right? You're reincarnated. Unless you escape from the reincarnation cycle and go into nirvana, right? But reincarnation is the rule of the day. So kill me and I'll be reincarnated, and you can kill me again. And I can be reincarnated. You can kill me a hundred times. See, this is not an abstract. This is not an abstract. He, he, he means this. He means that he, even though I die today, and if I'm reborn and I'm still loyal to the old king, you'll have to kill me again. And you can kill me a hundred times. Long after these bones from this body have turned to dust. And whether my soul goes on or not, whether it's reincarnated or not, the, the Korean uh, word for it is nokshirado iko opko. Iko opko means whether it is or whether it isn't. And this gets into the debate of Neo-Confucianism, or excuse me, of, of Buddhism. This gets into the debate of Buddhism. Is there reincarnation? Is there life after death? What about that? Is there? Some of you think so, some of you don't think so, right? I mean, even in this room right now, some of you think there is life after death. I do. Some of you think there is not life after death. This is it. It's done. You're toast. You're, you're through, right? In, in this very room, that debate still goes on. That debate was going on back then. Is there reincarnation? The Buddhists say so, but the Buddhists are nuts. They don't know everything. You know? No. Yes. <laughs> Which is it? And so he says, whether my soul exists or not, whether I am reincarnated or not, whether you can kill me a second time or a hundredth time or not, we don't know. We don't know whether this, whether this thing exists or not. But whether my soul goes on or whether it's, it's annihilated or whether I go into nirvana, regardless of that, my red heart will forever be loyal to my Lord, and it will never fade away. Isn't that something? That's just incredible. My red heart, the loyalty of this little heart of mine. Take my body and let it disintegrate, but my heart will live on forever. This is the Titanic song. Uh, I mean, these are eternal concepts. You know, it will go on forever. My heart will go on forever. Now, is, is, is this a fantasy or is this true? This, my friends, is truth. This is as true as things get. Chung Mong Ju was absolutely correct. His heart lives on today because every Korean school child 
in Korea knows e momi chuko chugo il pepong cocho chugo pekori chinto de on oxidado e coco nim hyang han il pentan chimia kashil to disuria. They know this poem. It lives. Chung Mong Ju's red heart lives. And so this is the dilemma of someone who is asked to join a new coup. And he chose not to join. And indeed, as he knew, he was executed. The story goes that he got on his horse after going to a dinner with Ibang Wan and was asked to join this coup. And he said, no, I can't do it. And there'd been some discussion about this. And he knew, he knew what he was doing. When he got on his horse, he got on backwards. He rode his horse backward home. And he said, you're not going to stab me in the back. I'm going to see you as you kill me. It happened on a bridge, they say, on a bridge crossing a little stream. The bridge is called the Good Bamboo Bridge, the Sanjukyo, but it's made of stone, and it's made of white granite. And if you go to the bridge, as I did a few years ago in Kesang, you can see the stains of his blood on that bridge to this very day. Well, at least that's the legend. Uh, we went to see the bridge, and the bridge is, is made of pure white granite. But the workers got a little skimpy, and over in this corner they used a piece of granite that had a little bit of iron oxide in it. <laughs> and when we go to Korea, we see some of these granite things. There's a foundation for a, uh, a Buddhist temple that is made of white granite, but has a lot of iron oxide in it. And these streaks of iron oxide, these dark red streaks that run through the, the granite, especially when it rains, is just radiant, and it looks like dried blood. And so that when, you, when we went to Kesong, uh, we were with a convoy of 14 buses from South Korea mostly South Koreans, just a handful of us foreigners on the last bus. And when we went to the bridge, everybody got off the bus. I couldn't even get near the bridge. <laughs> we milled around the bridge and looked at it. And the Koreans were saying, oh, it's true. It's true. You can see his blood right there. It's true. So the legend is true, okay? The story of Chung Mong Ju. Well, uh, yeah, I talked about this. This is the feudal battle against the Ming. Uh, so for years behind the scene, Chang Wong Ju, or excuse me, Yi Sung Ge <laughs> operates, decides who's loyal and who's not. Chang Wong Ju decides not to join the new kingdom. But finally, after four years, uh, Yi Sung Ge declares the founding of the new dynasty. And <coughs> they decided, they talked in those days about this dynasty lasting for 500 years. It's incredible. It lasted 518 years. Why did they set up a goal of having a dynasty last for 500 years? The Koryo dynasty had lasted 500 years. The Koryo dynasty had lasted 474 years. So 500 years virtually. So why not? You know, if you're going to set up a dynasty, you don't want to set up a short goal. You know, you want to do at least as well as the last dynasty had done. So they set up a goal to go 500 years, and they did. They talked about it, and it happened. They set up the foundations. This is long-range planning, okay? This is nice long-range planning. Okay, well, that's the founding of the dynasty. Now let's get to the 1400s. That's the 1300s. Let's get to the 1400s. The 1400s was the time of King Sejong. King Sejong is the the great culture hero of the Chosun dynasty. Okay, this is where we want to talk about the best of times. This was the best of times from 1418 to 1450. Who was uh, Sejong's father? Well, it turns out it's this guy, Ibang Wan, the third king of the dynasty. Now, Ibang Wan, the third king of the dynasty, was actually Isangge's fifth son. And the rule was they, they adopted a Chinese-style 
They borrowed from China their constitution, their code of laws. And the code book says the first son should be the king. Well, the second king was the fifth son. And so what happens when King Sejong comes along is that his father, Tejong, has a law that says the first son shall become the king. Well, he looked at his first son. He's a bright enough guy. He could be a good king. Second son is a bright enough guy. He could be a good king. But the third boy, his third son, was something else. And I don't know exactly how it worked, but I imagine, I imagine that it's like our students in our classroom. You know what it's like? Once in a while there's that kid that the headlights are on and just he gets everything. Just everything works for that kid. And that must have been the way it was with Sejong as a boy. Because his father decided that the first son was not going to be the king. The third son, Sejong, was going to be the king. So they break the rules right from the outset. But it's a good thing they did. Because breaking the rules was a great thing for this, for this kingdom, for this son. Because Sejong was off the charts. A smart, smart guy. And, and he made an excellent king. He became king when he was 21 years old. And he became king before his father died. His father abdicated and lived on, I think, another six years. Several more years, at least. And his father was his protector behind the scenes. Why? His father had killed a couple of brothers to get the throne himself. <laughs> and he didn't want a couple of brothers to kill good King Sejong, and so he abdicated and supported his son to make sure he was going to be a good, secure uh, king. Now, what about the first and second son? What happened to them? Well, as it turns out, if you talk to any Koreans today, uh, Koreans are named Kim, E, and Pak, right? And then a few other surnames. Kim, E, Pak, Che, and Chung is 55% of the population of Korea. E is, uh, uh, let's see, it's, e, e is 15%. 15% of Korea are named E. Lee. E, Lee, Ri, it's the same thing. And if you run into somebody named E from Korea, Lee, and uh, ask them who they're descended from, a great number of them are related to the royal family, descended from Lee sung -ge. And a great number of them are descended from Sejong's older brother. He has a huge posterity. He has something like 20 children or so. And uh, so <laughs> if you're not going to be the king, what you going to do? <laughs> he was busy. <laughs> he was busy. He had a big, pro big posterity. So if you're not going to be the king, you satisfy yourself with doing other things. And it turns out both the two older brothers have huge posterities, huger than his, than King Sejong's himself. But Sejong got to be the king, and he got to be the king because he was a very, very bright guy. Um, Gary Ledyard, who retired here at uh, Columbia University, taught Korean history for generations, uh, has, 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 is, fam is famous for saying that Koreans do not exaggerate the accomplishments of King Sejong. If, any, if anything, they understate them. You know, there's a tendency for us in any culture to glorify our cultural heroes. You know, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and, you know, all the great things that they did. Uh, and so you're a little bit suspicious sometimes when you hear Koreans bragging about what a great king King Sejong was. But they are not exaggerating. Everything you've read about King Sejong is true. It's not an exaggeration. The guy was a real genius, and he did a lot of things. Uh, he lived at a time of, in, in, if you look at the dynastic cycle, the theory of the dynastic cycle, uh, the best king is always the third or fourth king of any dynasty. And that's because the founder is a tough guy, a military guy, Second or third king consolidate things and get the taxes rolling in. And the best time of the dynasty is the time of the third or the fourth king. So King Sejong fits that, that, uh, that uh, theory 
uh, is a great example of how the third or fourth king is the best king in a dynasty. What did he do? Well, he fostered a bunch of things. He uh, was instrumental in collecting uh, and making an encyclopedia of medicine, medical treatments. He made an encyclopedia of pharma, uh, pharmacology, of herbs and such. These are two separate encyclopedias. Uh, medicine was mostly herbal medicine, but they had a, 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 an encyclopedia of medicine, an encyclopedia of herbs. They made maps of the entire uh, territory. Uh, King Sejong uh, was successful in a military operation against Tsushima. What is Tsushima? Tsushima is that island between Korea and Japan, a big island that's unquestionably in control of Japan. There's another island that Koreans and Japanese fight over, but this island is inhabited, has a lot of people on it, they're Japanese, and it's a place where pirates were based. And the pirates would raid the Korean shores. And so King Sejong invaded Tsushima and got the daimyo, the, the head man of Tsushima, to curtail pirate activity. And they made a treaty where Japanese could trade in four ports. And by giving access to four ports, there was no longer any need for piracy. And so uh, he does these intellectual things, he does this political thing, he does this military thing. And by the way, the invasion of Tsushima was all set up by his father, who was a general, who set it up, had it all set to go, and then Sejong gets the credit for carrying it out. So he does military things. Uh, he's famous for setting up these rain gauges all around the country so we can have an accurate measure of what kind of rainfall we get and, and where droughts might be and that sort of thing. Uh, astronomical observatories. He had several astronomical observatories and several astronomical uh, instruments for observing the skies. I'll show you pictures of some of them here in a minute. He was famous for uh, uh, ritual and ritual music. Why? They've got a new court, it's just getting up and set up, and they want to have proper ritual at court. And at court, you have court music. I'm giving you a de an example of the detail to which King Sejong was involved in, in uh, uh, practical matters. In the court, you have to have good ritual, and you have to have good music. Now, what kind of music do you have for the ritual? Well, Confucius said that you need... Uh, that Good music cultivates the soul, and wild music enrages the beast. Is that true? <laughs> I think it's true. <laughs> Some of the wild music you hear. And he wanted to have good, cultured music. Now, it turns out that, Sej that uh, uh, Sejong was concerned about Confucian ritual, of course, and among this Confucian ritual... Uh, there, the, there were texts where Confucius talked about music, and he talked about instruments for, for playing the music. And so King Sejong put his court musician to work on this. Now it turns out, we know about this guy. His name was Pak Yun, Pak Yun. And it turns out that one of my classmates in graduate school wrote his dissertation on Pak Yun. The classmate's name is Rob Provine. He recently retired at the University of Maryland. Rob Provine was a wonderful musician. He could play Scott Joplin before Scott Joplin became cool, uh, before The Sting and, and Scott Joplin became a, a fashionable. Uh, he was a great pianist and a great musicologist, ethnomusicologist, and a great scholar of classical Chinese. So Rob Provine had it all, and he wrote his dissertation on Pag Yen. And Rob likes to tell the story of Pag Yen and his, the, the, the care with which he did his scholarship. And here's the, here's the story. Uh, in, in constructing the instruments for the court orchestra, they have the descriptions from the Chinese classics, from Confucius himself, it was said. Probably wasn't, but they said it was Confucius. And they had a flute, which was described as 100 rice grains in length, cut of a bamboo tube, such that the volume of the tube would hold 300 grains of rice. So 100 to 300 was the ratio, and then you cut the holes like so. They had illustrations of how you cut the holes, and then you'd have good music. Well, Pagyan was very careful about this, and he did just as the text said, 100 grains of rice, 300 in volume. You know, you can get a 
tube of uh, bamboo that's this big, or you can get a tube that's this big, you know, and it was, a, it was just the right volume to hold 300 grains of rice. And he cut the holes just right, and blew on it, it was sour, it was awful. Pagan says, what are we going to do? Uh, the text says right here. And uh, Pagan had gone to China to see what the Chinese were doing. I mean, they were serious about this. And Pagan goes to China and comes back and finds out that the Chinese are not playing the music the way the text said. So what do we do? And he goes to King Sejong and says, do we do what the Chinese are doing? Or we do what the text says. What did Sejong say? The text. Do it by the text. And so we're not following China, per se. We're following the Chinese scholar Confucius. We're doing what Confucius said. So they cut the bamboo flute, blow on it. It's awful. Poggins, well, how can this be? Confucius said this. And then he starts thinking, you know, there are different sizes of rice. And maybe Confucius had a different kind of rice. So he starts experimenting with other grains, and he finds a grain of millet that if it's 100 to 300, you cut it, the music's sweet. And so he's, oh, Confucius must have had this kind of a grain for his rice. And so it's to that extent they were serious about this, you see. And the story that I gave you about music there are also similar stories about uh, the scientific inventors and uh, a guy named Chang that was his scientist. And uh, they were very serious about all of these uh, scientific and ritual things that they were looking at. Of course, the, the crowning achievement, let's see, I've got, yeah. Uh, the crowning achievement, of course, of all of the things that King Sejong did was, was the creation of Hangul. Now, I mentioned these other things to show you that this, this, this comes from an intellectual context that's very Renaissance, it's very broad. Uh, th this guy was not just a linguist, but he was interested in all sorts of scientific things. And when it came to language, he applied the same kind of scientific rigor as he had to these other things. Okay? So when he comes up with Hangul, it's a very scientific language, or very scientific script, I should say. The language is the language, but the script is what he invented. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about this because... You look at the schedule. You're going to see me again. <laughs> We're going to do a piece on Hangul in some detail. Uh, is it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? I think it's the day after tomorrow, isn't it? I, uh, you're going to get a, a chunk of me today, a chunk of me tomorrow, and a chunk of me on Thursday. And then you're going to get rid of me. And I'm going down to Virginia. I'm going to do a program down in Virginia, the University of Virginia, similar to this. Uh, but we'll do Hangul in a couple of days, okay? And we'll go into more detail and we'll talk about the specifics of the scientific aspect and the, the logic, the theory that goes behind the, uh, the alphabet. And I'll have you uh, singing songs and reading Korean before the end of that day, okay? Uh, so uh, more on that later. But with the alphabet invented, he also got into printing. And they had, they had already created metal movable font typefaces for printing. And they did it again under King Sejong. And he had these typefaces in Chinese, because everything scholarly in Korea up to this point was Chinese, okay? And also in Hangul. And he, he has a set of fonts in Hangul, so they could print things off in Hangul. And uh, he also used this Hangul alphabet to write a poem. He commissioned his scholars to write this poem that was an epic poem lionizing the founders of the, of the dynasty. Now, uh, this poem was no simple poem. It was 125 verses long, and it was set up in couplets. The first two lines of the couplet praised some Chinese king or emperor for something heroic that he had done. The second two lines praised the ancestors of Sejong for something heroic that they had done. So it was a, it's a great uh, poem. Um, it's called The Songs of the Dragons Flying to Heaven. And it's translated in English. You can get a copy of it if you want. There are two translations of it in English, actually. Um, so he commissioned his scholars to use this uh, new alphabet to 
uh, write a poem to make it work, do something with it, you see. So they made Hangul a living, viable alphabet. Uh, by the way, when he commissioned his scholars to do this, when I use that phrase, very often when people talk about King Sejong creating the alphabet, they talk about him commissioning his scholars to create the alphabet. In reality, he was fighting his scholars. There were a number in the court that were against this alphabet. And it's all the more magnificent and all the more credit to King Sejong that they did that he did the alphabet himself because he did it over the objections of his of his court. The court said, you know, we have Chinese. Why bother with some new alphabet? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, they were using Chinese up to this point. And the scholars said, well, we've got the Chinese, we've got the classics. What else do we need? You know, we've got it all right here. And uh, King Sejong, in the preface to the alphabet, to the declaration of the alphabet, the preface says, in sympathy for my people who do not have a way to read and write, uh, I've created this alphabet. And so he saw that the elite class had education in the form of Chinese characters, but the common class didn't. And he, he said, in sympathy for my people. Uh, so, uh, you know, in Confucianism, it talks about the king being sympathetic to the people. Confucianism is not a dictatorial kind of thing. It, it's a very sympathetic kind of a thing. And, and the goodness of the king, the goodness of the king is what we're talking about all the time. You know, the king should be good. He should be moral. That's what Confucianism is all about, the morality of the king, the morality of the government. And King Sejong was just a perfect example of this. He was absolutely moral, absolutely concerned with his, his people, and uh, the alphabet was one reflection of that. Uh, also using the uh, alphabet, he uh, ordered uh, a writing of the biography of the Buddha. Whoa! A Confucian scholar is writing about the Buddha? The court again objected to this. But King Sejong said, no, my people are interested in the Buddha. And here's this Hangul that they can use so they can learn more about the Buddha. If they're going to believe it, they should learn about it. And they, sh they should believe it. So he ordered the printing, uh, the writing of and the printing of a text about Buddhism, which, you know, the, the Confucian scholars at the court, oh, no, Buddhism, no, you don't do that, you see. There's this rivalry between Buddhism and Confucianism that goes on and creates a very creative tension that you see throughout Korean history. Okay, so that's uh, King Sejong. Um, we're about an hour and a half into it. We're going until noon today. Let's take a break at this point, and then we'll pick up and talk about the 1500s, 1600s. I guess we're not quite halfway, but that's all right. We're halfway in time. Let's take a break and uh, come back in 10 minutes. Is that okay?